Greetings, I'm the Mothman Historian, and welcome to a follow-up discussion. Dave, could you please introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Dave Henderson. I'm southwestern part of Virginia, Giles County area, actually. Born and raised here. Uh, I've lived here 90% of my life, way in the, uh, I guess you'd say, the, the backwoods part of the, the area. And it led to a lot of mountain lore and folklore, and, and that kind of stuff stuck with me, and I've uh, kind of followed it ever since. So I was going to ask you if you'd ever done Sasquatch research, because I know you have done paranormal research, like more ghost focused stuff, but if you're done like Sasquatch or UFOs. In all honesty, I mean, I haven't gotten a great deal into it, not as much as I would like. I have gone on walks through the area to kind of follow up on reported sightings. There there have been a few in this general area. I live about a mile off the Appalachian Trail itself. I've gone walking through there just to kind of, you know, see the areas where people have reported various sightings here and there, um, setting fields to go watch the sky, so to speak. You know, I've seen some interesting light activity here and there, but yeah, that really, you know, go and, you know, full blown, you know, Sasquatch hunt or UFO hunt. That I've unfortunately just you know, not gotten quite as in depth as I wanted to on it. Have you ever read up on UFOs? Yeah, I've I've definitely done my fair share of reading on both subjects. I say the uh I mean I like a lot of the the work that uh, you know, as as you're a, a huge Killian, you you know, you're well, well familiar with his work. You know, I like reading up on stuff from like uh, Nick Redfern. He's, I think, done a lot of work and study into the area. You know, kind of gravitate towards a lot of the older books before, I guess, it was more mainstream. And yeah, it, it seemed a little more wholesome back in the books from the, you know, the more 50s, 60s, you know, maybe early 70s. So yeah, it's point. more like uh, weird science, speculative science. What are these bizarre lights in the sky? Yeah, very much so. So the previous meeting that we did, we talked about organizing and things like that. One thing that the Best Virginian brought up was Ruth Ann Music's archive, and I looked more into that. It turns out Ruth Ann Music, who's a, a famous West Virginia folklorist, she has a niece, Pat Music, who runs the West Virginia Folklife Archive, and apparently there is some extensive folklore notes there from uh, her aunt that is 12 to 20 books worth of material. So that sounds pretty interesting. But from what I've gathered, it's not accessible to the public. And who knows what they plan to do with it, if they plan to make it accessible, digitize it, or make it into some books. I read the article that he linked in chat there. I just wanted to follow up on that and say that that is apparently a thing. Oh, well, that's, uh, I haven't had a chance to, to read the article that he posted there, but I mean, you know, from your description, if they do find an outlet for its release, that would be you know, fantastic. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, Maybe they just got it and they're like sorting through it or something. But yeah, I hope they do something with that because 12 to 20 books worth, that sounds like quite the collection. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, that's that's got to be a, a gratuitous amount of information. Yeah, and uh, Ruth Ann Music, she was like a uh, college teacher and all she did really was tell her students to bring forth their family stories. And just from that, laid a lot of groundwork for West Virginia folklore. The White Things in 1920, that one of the first published stories of that is in her books. So yeah, just by asking around and marking it down, she was able to do some really good work. And um, if you haven't read her books, the first one is The Telltale Lilac Bush. And the second one is Coffin Hollow. And Coffin Hollow is actually a posthumous book. It was put together by her students after uh, her passing. So yeah, in her short time of gathering West Virginia folklore stories, she sure gathered a lot. Do you know of any um, Virginia folklore books or folklorists? Let's see. I'm trying to think of uh, any that are, are, I guess you'd say, Virginia specific. Yeah, I've got a, I got a handful of just more or less um, generalized Appalachian folklore, mm -hmm. and you know, I've of course got a, a fairly decent sized set of the old Foxfire books, which are you know invaluable to anyone living in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, I got Mountain Mysteries by a gentleman named Thacker. Oh, there was a gentleman, and his name is unfortunately slipping me out at the moment, but he wrote, it's got to be, I think, 20 volumes of a series called Ghosts of Virginia. Well, the first, I don't know, dozen or so books are more or less more specifically ghost-driven, uh, but he does start gathering more information on other tales and stories of just odd things that have happened to people in the states of Virginia, or in the state of Virginia, so... I mean, that was a, a rather good series that I've, you know, I've got at least seven or eight of them of, uh, out of there. 
Another thing I wanted to follow up on or go into more is um, sort of these cultural hubs that there are across the mountain state, Flatwoods, Point Pleasant, and also recently Grafton. And by cultural hubs, I kind of mean places where people go to share stories or places that have become like a collection of their local folklore. And the first one being the Mothman Museum in Point Pleasant, and the next one being the Flatwoods Museum. Uh, the way these happen is they, they kind of spring up naturally. In Point Pleasant, it was Jeff Wamsley who ran a record store called Criminal Records, and uh, he started selling t-shirts, like Mothman t-shirts, and people kept coming in there asking about the Mothman. Eventually, he started um, ha handing them essentially a manila envelope with some Mothman information in it. Um, he went around interviewing witnesses, and he kind of just amassed some information on it. Because Walmsley, he also, he had a, his partner there, Donnie Sargent Jr., who helped him put up a, draft up a website, and that was mothmanlives.com, the first official Mothman website. He also helped him write a book, The Mothman, Facts Behind the Legend. He was a graphic designer, so I guess they worked together on t-shirts, and then they worked together on the website, then they worked together on the book. And then eventually, Linda Scarberry gave him her collection of newspaper clippings, because apparently she had saved those, and it kind of just grew out from there. He went down to where they filmed The Mothman uh, Prophecies movie, and one of the locals there who owned a grocery store had apparently bought a bunch of the props from the movie and had them in his grocery store, like kind of like a tourist thing for a while. As the popularity died down in that filming location, the guy had all these props, so he gave them to Jeff Walmsley. So it seems like all of that just kind of fell together there, and uh, he was nice enough to make his record store into a monster museum. And it's just kind of crazy how that all comes together. Now, people go in there into the gift shop and things like that and share stories and, you know, more things get put there. And, you know, if someone has some Mothman stuff, they probably would send it on down there. So I just wanted to bring up that, that idea of like a cultural hub. Yeah, man, that actually sounds like a pretty cool tell. I hadn't actually heard uh, the story behind the, the Mothman Museum. Um, but, yeah, uh, it's, you know, unfortunately, I'm not aware of anything like that here in the, the state of Virginia or anywhere close to where I'm at. But, I mean, having something established like that, that I really think that is a, a fantastic idea. In Point Pleasant, there was also the Mothman Diner, ran by Caroline Harris, uh, who unfortunately passed away in 2016, I believe. Um, one th other thing I was going to bring up is Lauren Coleman. He went down there to Point Pleasant and kind of helped to instruct Walmsley, telling him, like, you know, in the early 2000s when this movie comes out, you know, the publicity of the movie, you guys better be ready. You better have, like, a statue, a museum, a festival. You know, that's, in a sense, a grassroots organizing as well. And the same thing uh, sort of happened with Flatwoods, is uh, the Flatwoods Museum sprung up from Andrew Smith, who I've met and talked to. He essentially had like a shelf in his office that was Flatwood stuff, and it grew out into a whole museum, basically. And now people go in there and share stories, and there's like sort of paranormal convention type things going on there, where people will set up desks in the inside the museum and sell paranormal books and all that. It's cool when something like that props up, and the researchers have somewhere to go. More stations for the paranormal stuff we need. Sometimes when there is a monster, eventually the community just kind of brings up around it naturally, and oftentimes it will just start with someone selling t-shirts or some kind of piece of novelty. And an example of that would be with Flatwoods. There was, in 1970, there was a ceramic lantern, something that they put a candle in and it, uh, the eyes glow and stuff like that, a way for the Chamber of Commerce to get funding, right? And then I guess it, it got immortalized in photos and people knew that it existed. So at some point, people saw that and they're like, wow, I want one of those. So they uh, fired up the materials to start making them again. And uh, another thing that drove the interest was they opened up the... Um, Gray Barker archive, so that was a thing. And I think the lanterns became a reason that people went down to Flatwoods because you could only get them from certain gift shops down there at Flatwoods. And one of them was like a Sunoco gas station, and they just had those sitting there on the shelf. And now the museum is just filled with those lanterns. They make different painted versions of them, and uh, th that was probably the first item that Andrew Smith laid there on that shelf is that lantern. A knick-knack like that or some piece of novelty can help to revive interest in a folklore and help keep it alive because every time someone sees that piece of artwork, they're reminded of the story or they ask, what is that? And the story gets told again. It shows how that sort of link in the chain 
keeps it going because you know folklore doesn't exist if it stops being told it has to continue to be told repetition keeps it alive so now currently in flatwoods there is the the braxton county monster museum and what i'm keeping my eye on right now is grafton west virginia because the grafton monster was recently featured uh not too long ago in the fallout 76 video game and because of that they started making t-shirts and there is a gift shop down there in Grafton, which now has a big Grafton monster sign on it. So you see how, once you start to recognize it, you can kind of see how that starts to, to happen. I'm sure people will come in there and maybe share some stories. You know, I, I spot these cultural hubs that pop up every every so often in different places. These things kind of spring up from whether, you know, as, as you're pointing out, you know, Fallout 76 or Mothman movie, how that drives a lot of these, uh, me- or how media drives a lot of these things into a, a much broader spotlight and helps kind of keep it alive. So that's, yeah. Yeah, definitely. The the Fallout 76, that, that is the equivalent of a, a major motion picture. You know, video games have become such a big industry. That is essentially the equivalent. I've heard it called uh, dark tourism. I've heard it called crypto tourism. People, for whatever reason, they really want to drive down to the location where something like that happens. The phenomena is called legend tripping, where people want to go down to where something happened. I mean, I've been down to the TNT area countless times, so I get that. You know, you think that maybe the monster will jump out and say hello, even though people have been going there for decades and decades and decades. You think maybe this will be the one time where it, it triggers whatever happened that night that makes it happen again. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, legend tripping is, is definitely a, a, a thing unto itself. And I, I love the, the, the concept of it. And I think that um, was it Jeff Ballinger definitely put that that terminology on the on the radar for everyone but uh i think he made an entire web series out of legend trip and going to the various sites like you're describing to go to you know the these cultural hubs and the the locations where things occurred and it's you know that was a pretty interesting series i think it's at least a decade or so old at this point some pretty cool stuff that he ran into when he was doing that we, we talked in the last meeting about how we could find these sort of sightings. I think a good place to, to look would be places like that. There might be people who walk in and say, hey, I saw something like that. Or, hey, while we're talking about UFOs, let me tell you what I saw. Or let me tell you what my uncle saw. Because the people who go there, by necessity, they are interested in that subject. So they might be researchers or they might be witnesses. So uh, another thing I was going to mention about the Grafton Monster, the sign that's on top of the coffee shop now, it used to be actually on plywood where the monster was supposedly seen, but apparently it was stolen, but they managed to get it back, and uh, I guess they decided to put it up so people couldn't get it again. So I think that's a, a bizarre thing that happened there. It was a, a news story. You know, the Grafton Sentinel, which became the Mountain Statesman, was actually the newspaper that first printed the Grafton Monster story, and it's also the newspaper in which the um, witness worked for, uh, Robert Cockrell, and that newspaper put out a, a picture of these um, policemen holding up the sign when they got it back, and so it's just kind of funny that the monster, all these years later, gets put in the same paper again. <laughs> indeed, man, indeed. From the last meeting, what I, I gathered here is, as our main goals would be collecting stories through interview, working towards a database, and then also resources for fellow investigators and archivists. So I was wanting to know if you had any ideas for what kinds of resources, like how we could put those together and where we could send them and how that could be distributed. I think some of the topics would be like how to conduct an interview, how do we get that knowledge and put it out to people. Yeah, I think that... um Something along the lines of, yeah, structuring out a proper set of guidelines for a, a conducting a proper interview uh, would be at the, the top of the list when it comes to encouraging others to do interviews. Kind of brainstorming, you know, pulling various resources, you know, what's worked in the past for me for an interview, what's worked in the past for you for an interview. You know, maybe, as you mentioned in the last call, um, using something structured like a, um, uh, like a policeman would use for an interview or type an investigator that way and being able to collect the right data points that we're looking for and to be able to ask, you know, an interviewee 
the same question, you know, multiple times without it seeming like the same question. So that way you can ensure consistency in their answers. And of course, the we're talking about witness interviews here. Uh, there has to be some way to ask questions and they're like very non-leading. This is where entertainment kind of goes away because if you record uh, an interview like that, it's often very dry and you can't tip your hand. You have to kind of put on a poker face and not really react or chime in with your own theories or like, oh, well, did you know this? And did you know that? Because then you're sort of contaminating the witness with your own perspective. You know, I conducted that interview with Ryan and Carly and I tried to keep it to a minimum like until I had pretty much asked them everything I had already wanted to ask them about a subject before I chimed in with a piece of like info. If you were doing like a very serious interview and you wanted it to be like that you'd have to not do that ever. So I definitely got to get more experience doing witness interviews and then maybe I could work more towards um, putting out some kind of structure based thing. But yeah, I think if you did that it would it would make for a very boring listen for anyone listening. But I guess that's not the point. I mean, the the initial fact gathering, I guess, is the, the, the dry part of it. I mean, if you go and you kind of go into the, the beginning of an open-ended and be like, hey, tell me your story from, from start to finish. And you know, that is your kind of, if you're, you're looking to make a YouTube video out of it or something like that, that's more or less the part you publish. You know, it's, it's kind of like doing any, uh, any type of research and trying to make some kind of entertainment out of it is that there's going to be a hundred hours worth of work for one hour to show the public, you know? So it's, it's going to be very much that way. Yeah. And I do think it can be done of course, because there are like true crime podcasts and videos and stuff that are just kind of, uh, that s same procedural interview style. And, you know, you can just make a, a nice video about it summarizes work that probably took hours and hours and hours. Yeah. And I mean, and once you, you get into the, the, the nitty gritty of your interviews and you've gotten your main data points, then you can get into the more, I guess say colorful questions of, you know, the, how did it make you feel? How did it do us? The, the more, yeah, I guess, personal emotional questions. aspect. Yeah. Personal stuff that it makes it more relatable to a listener or a viewer. So, and you don't chime in specifically with, it was like this, wasn't it? Cause that's a, a leading question as opposed to a, just a straight question. Yeah, so that's not what I mean by that. Oh yeah. Very much so. Yeah, you definitely don't want to front load your the person you're interviewing with, you know, imagery that they can, you know, bring back and feed to you later. I mean, that that's almost setting yourself up for, for failure from the very beginning. Yeah, but yeah, after I, you get the the actual sighting, I, I do feel it's important to investigate the witness as well because uh, that's what Keel talked about is um, asking them everything, getting to know them a lot because he felt there was some mystery there as opposed to just what they saw. That um, I guess maybe he thought that certain people. People were chosen to have seen something that may be like a fatalistic idea because you know when we look at these things we question the experience but we also question like the person and the place like that's where the whole window area idea comes from is maybe the place is special and then if it's not the place well maybe the person is special maybe they were psychic maybe they had this and that and so I think that's why why people go so in depth into the life of the witness is to try to figure out if there's something there like specifically them yeah, I mean, and that's that's something I've done in past interviews with, um, I guess you would say, when we've helped uh, uh, families out investigating their homes and things like that. That's You see they've got 30 books of, on the occult sitting on their shelf, and, you know, they've got all kinds of movies and everything like that. It kind of gives you a clue into that person's mindset, where they're coming from, versus you walk into a house, and they might have pictures of puppy dogs and kitty cats, but they're telling you the, the world's most strangest stuff, you know. It's good to see their level of knowledge about the subject and also, I guess, what their general interests are. Keep in mind, though, that sometimes their sighting will cause them to be interested. So there is that. Yeah. And I mean, and that's kind of one of the questions that you, you delve into during your, your interview is, did you have a previous interest in, you know, this or is this something that, you know, yeah, is more, you know, recent, like you said, you know, just in your, your, your ability to be able to, I guess, kind of read people uh, yeah. helps in that department. Something else I was going to talk about is when you're examining a witness, people will often find trends. For example, there are people who say that certain blood types, like, oh, these people are more likely to have a paranormal encounter. And I think a lot of that is pattern seeking and just sort of coincidental stuff. I don't know if that kind of analysis of the witness is really helpful or not. Do you have any takes on that, the sort of looking for trends in the type of witness? 
I think some of that can just get really silly to where you're overanalyzing the witness uh, and sometimes overanalyzing the location. Like, oh, it's near water. It's like everything is near water. I mean, a lot of that stuff I do believe to be people, as you say, finding their own patterns and things. You know, I do suspect a trend sometimes of things, you know, down a family line or, you know, something within a certain area, you know, because it doesn't have to necessarily, as you say, be near water or be near a particular type of rock formation or whatever. But it could very well be, as you know, Kill quoted, a, a window area. If there's certain activity confined to a, you know, a 10 mile radius, so to speak, that people see stuff in that area quite frequently, but outside that area, no, then, you know, there might be a little, little more validity to that. Yeah. I do think there are certain people in certain places, but I just worry sometimes about, because we're always looking at the, the occurrence and trying to break it apart into pieces saying, okay, was it the location? Was it the person? What's special about the location? What's special about the person? Because I think you could go down wrong assumptions there based on uh, what is essentially correlation without causation. So if you do that, you can go down the wrong roads, I think, and sort of miss the point. Because I, I do believe that anyone could have a paranormal experience, a paranormal encounter. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it, it's just not, as you say, limited to get anyone into any kind of odd situation. So. Okay. What we need to do is amass our own data, but also make use of the archives that already exist that are available, both digital and in the real world. Uh, one of the things that would start with that is figuring out what archives there are that are available. So that's something that we certainly need to do in our group, and every group that's interested in the paranormal and 40 and phenomena should do, is try to amass our own data, but also there are people who have already done some of the legwork for us that we can look to, as long as it's open and available and we're respectful with the material. Discovering these these resources and then, you know, having a place where we keep track of them, we can share them within the team and then, you know, within anyone that's just looking for information in general saying, hey, yeah, we've discovered this this resource here. And like, um, I guess, listing the different uh, pages that have archives. Yeah. So now another point I was going to make here is that I was trying to think of what the closest thing that a 40 in or a paranormal investigator really is. And when we're talking about books and sort of print media, the closest thing is like, uh, you know, newspaper writers or amateur local journalists. That's probably the closest thing that would describe what we do. I mean, I could agree with that. Yeah. Amateur local journalists of a very specific subject. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I think you've named or nailed the uh, terminology right on the head there. So. Because mm-hmm. I, I did a Grafton Monster video, and I went down to where the sighting happened, and I went and stood in front of the newspaper uh, building and stood in front of the, the riverbank where it was supposedly seen, and I was just filming myself standing there telling the story, and it occurred to me, like, hey, it's like a newsman standing in front of, like, uh, you know, some news story thing, right? right. So that would be the, yeah. the more TV or video uh, side of the journalism, but the books and stuff is pretty much print media, and that's what the, um, the old old school saucer people were doing when they had their fanzines and newsletters you know it's like a newspaper yeah and i mean the the amateur journalist if looking at it is definitely a, a way to describe what's being done or what we're attempting to do so local journalists and uh investigative journalists have really gone away because they don't have the money to keep running now we mainly have like the the mainstream and then like the social media some of the best Fortean researchers, some of them start off as journalists or have some kind of uh, experience in that. John Keel was a New York writer, and um, Mary Heyer, she was a, an actual journalist, and then she eventually started covering UFO stories. Uh, the same is true of Linda Godfrey. The whole Bray Road Beast thing happened, and then she started collecting those werewolf stories. So, yeah, a lot of the, the greats, they start off as journalists, and then they focus specifically on this subject. Definitely. Um, And I mean, that's taking a a journalistic approach to it, being able to run down a a good story, collect the proper facts, things like that. I mean, that's definitely a a good foundation to the approach that, yeah, any of the, I guess the people that's a part of this group take to maybe help help things grow, help collect data, help collect stories. One thing that brings me to mention is the, um, the newspapers at the time. Some of them were pretty good at documenting the story. Uh, a lot of them kind of dismissed it or didn't really want to take it seriously. And so they kind of just run an article that's kind of a jokey article, you know, like, hey, I don't take this seriously kind of thing. 
uh, eventually so many UFO stories get reported to the newspaper, they kind of have to make the decision, are they going to keep printing these, and how often are they going to print them? Because, you know, it is just some person looks up, sees a light in the sky, it disappears, you know, it, it is sort of the same story over and over again. Uh, to us, it's interesting data, but to the average person, you know. Yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's only so much, uh, you know, if you're, I guess, trying to entertain people with your, your newspaper, that if you're saying the same thing over and over and over, there's not a whole lot of meat to go with potatoes, so to speak. There was one paper that actually uh, decided that they weren't going to print UFO stories, so they officially announced a UFO ban that they wouldn't run any more flying saucer stories because there were so many of them, and they felt they were kind of repetitive. I could um, pull up the headline real quick. Illinois paper bans stories on saucers, and it is um, a ban on the flying saucer stories has been announced by the Ottawa Daily Republican Times. In an editorial printed yesterday, manager editor Robert Hames told the paper's 12,000 purchasers, we're not printing them anymore. We've chosen sides, and we invite the 1,700 other daily newspapers in the nation to join in a fight against feeding pap to the newspaper public. <laughs> so he, he's not just, um, not just banning it, but he's calling on other people to not print them anymore. And this is um, August 7th, 1952. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's something else, man. That is, uh, well, I mean, you said they... There was a, a a very big push to make things look as hokey as possible from mainstream media. So, yeah, I'm sure this tied right into that. Yeah, he's a regular men in black. It explains that for five years we've been shrugging our shoulders and resigned ourselves to reading about deranged discs that lit through one end of the country to the other, sometimes with blinding flashes, other times eloping with a soft light. The perpetually flying plates have made headlines year after year, despite the fact the most extensive investigations have failed to uncover a solitary, substantive clue pointing to their existence. Tomorrow, if some Texan tells the police a flying saucer ran his car off a gravel road, he won't get his name in the Daily Republican Times. <laughs> so that's, that's the full article there. Wow. Yeah, man, that is something else. So um, one thing I wanted to bring up from the the last meeting is um, I just watched it through as editing it. We went two hours talking about the field without speculating about what any of these things are. <laughs> And I think that's really good because it's very rare that you'd have a conversation with investigators or with, you know, researchers of any kind without them uh, talking or debating or mentioning what these things are. But we just talked about how we're going to document them. And I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I mean, without a doubt, uh, that definitely shows a uh, an openness to everyone's kind of varied opinions. And, you know, no one was trying to, to push their own point of view or idea on anyone but yeah just kind of leaving it you know because that should open. be sort of uh you know secondary yeah that's a that's a problem that comes up with a lot of groups fellow researchers who want to join certain groups and maybe that group is all et centric they believe in the extraterrestrial hypothesis they might not let them in that's actually a unfortunately a, a true thing for certain groups is if they come in saying that they're psychic manifestations or they're something else or they're man-made or whatever theory they have uh they might tell them kick rocks yeah and I mean, and, and that's a, a shame that, you know, groups like that don't allow a little more varied opinion or openness because becoming that closed minded, I, I, mean, I believe we mentioned, you know, this very quote on the, the last call or it could have been actually one of the post here is how when you get into that mindset, it becomes a game of trying to make the data and the things that are, you know, collected, that evidence fit your paradigm versus making, you know, proper analysis of that evidence and taking it all in as a whole. So. Yeah, exactly. And that um, the analysis needs to be secondary to the gathering of data because no analysis can be made without the data. And you need the data to be accounted for in your theory. You need to be more, like, informed on your theorizing and speculation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you've got to be able to, you know, look at the whole picture and, and not just try to focus in on, you know, one little small corner of the, the picture, so to speak, and, you know, lose sight of the, the forest for the trees. Yeah, and... um uh, I mentioned UFOs, but I, I want to say broadly that there are Sasquatch clubs and uh, paranormal teams that all have that sort of problem where uh, sometimes they have one perspective and they don't allow another perspective, uh, and sometimes they don't allow a lot of skepticism. For example, if you have someone who's very into debunking or into trying to disprove everything, they'll say, no, you're a bit of a buzzkill. Oh, yeah, you, you definitely get that label of being a, a rabble-rouser, and you know once you start questioning you know something that they have held as the truth then they they want no part of you anymore 
Yeah, and, and some groups, it uh, seems, unfortunately, do like to continue to perpetuate hoaxes even when they've kind of been proven to be hoaxes. And I don't really understand the mentality behind that, but, you know, that's a thing, apparently. Like, for example, like, if, if I'm uh, talking about a story and someone has, like, some evidence or some data to show that it's been proven a hoax or that it could be a hoax, I definitely want to hear that data because I don't want to perpetuate a hoax and I don't want to go around talking about something without being properly informed or without knowing that it's been disproven, you know? So I'd rather someone yeah, I mean, tell me that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, being able to look at all sides of a, a particular situation that you're you're investigating, you know, whether it's something you want to hear or not, I mean, all of that's important because even if you don't agree with 80% of what this other person's saying, you know, there's still 20% there that could be, you know, very valid information that could make you stop and go, no, wait, that guy's not, not you know, completely wrong. You know, there, there, there could be some validity to that. You know, and it's uh, it's important to remain open and to be able to, to take in whether it's a skeptical point of view, a debunker's point of view, a, a full on believer's point of view. You know, you need to be a, as as open as possible to hearing all sides. Yeah, and it definitely does go the other way because not every uh, supposed debunking is actually a debunking. Sometimes people will say this is case closed and in actuality there is more to it. So you have to be able to hear that side as well. I want to try to weigh out what the truth is and what has been proven and yeah. what's, you know, non-proven. Yeah, very much so. Uh, another point I was going to bring up is um, we need to, a lot of researchers need to get the information out there because we have a bad habit of keeping it too close to our chest and uh, researching in solitude and silence. I was going to see if maybe you would come up with any reasons why that is, because I, I still wonder about that. Uh, maybe it's because we're kind of akin to the occult, and occultic people uh, work in secrecy, and so maybe people think when you're studying spooky stuff, you should work in secrecy. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, that definitely plays a, a large part into it, I think, because you know, as soon as you get the, uh, the label, uh, that's that weird guy that lives on the hill that you know does nothing but look at ghosts and UFOs. You, know, you capture that stigma from, I guess you'd say, the general public, and people, people don't want that label. They don't want to be known as that weird guy on the hill. They look at people that aren't aware of you know, groups like you know, this one that we're, we're discussing right now, where it's a completely open forum of people being able to get together to discuss ideas openly and through a, a non, I guess you say critical channel. I mean, you know, no one here, this group is going to condescend someone for their, their ideas or their theories or anything like that. So, you know, yeah. being able to advertise this to those that are armchair researchers that, that, you know, they may think that they have to go join a, a ghost hunting group to get that kind of community, but, you know, built, you know, online first and kind of grow from there, you know, this is a chance for those armchair researchers to, you know, find somewhere to go. And mm -hmm. I guess kind of the last part of that is, uh, you you do have your people that think they're going to be the one to discover the unified theory of everything and they don't want to share that so i do think maybe it's because we study outcasted information and a lot of people who do that are outcast themselves so maybe it, it attracts a certain introverted type yeah i think that is very much a truth man i can definitely uh i can definitely agree with that point of view a lot more introverts that study this than I, I can think of than, than extroverts. So. <laughs> yeah, which is why it's good to try to foster that kind of attitude. And, exactly. Uh, yeah, and um, what you pretty much went into there is that much like the paranormal witness who doesn't want to come forward because they're afraid of how they'd be judged, I guess there are certain investigators who do the same. Yeah, they're afraid of what the, the people that live next door might think. Yeah, so as researchers, we definitely need to be looking to uh, elucidate as opposed to obfuscate, because we may be a mystery society, but our goal was to reveal the mysteries and to document them, to illuminate them, instead of keeping them in secrecy. Uh, we need to not only make resources, but collect the already available resources, especially the free resources, and link to those and point to those as well. But from what I've seen, a lot of the current resources out there uh, are very ineffectual and unsophisticated. So do you know any, like, books or pamphlets, how to investigate, how to do uh, interviews for Fordian subjects? Um, I can't uh, think of any titles off the top of my head, to be, you know, 100% honest, because a lot of what I've, I've followed has been by 
you know, I guess say kind of one of my mentors. And then also, you know, from what I've learned from my own personal experience and that what I think is the, the, the proper approach, which is kind of more like a, I don't want to say like a, a police investigators approach where you want to collect the hard facts without any, you know, as we discussed in the bullet points back, you know, without coloring anything with their own personal opinion or leading a witness. But yeah, as for an actual just good resource to refer someone to, that's where I think we might be on our own at coming up with our own set of guidelines. Um, I think for the past 60, 70 years now, people have, have sort of just been, uh, I guess, learning from the other investigators. Like, oh, he asked a question like that, or he went to the location and did this. So I guess that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, that's what I've done with John Keel and Jeff Walmsley and other investigators I enjoy, is I kind of try to reverse engineer what they've done and say, okay, this, this part worked and this part didn't and kind of just try to learn from what they've already done. But they didn't like lay it out specifically, like this is what you should do. They just did those things. Yeah, you put it best in being able to reverse engineer what the, the people have come before us have done. I mean, that's that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Unless there's some obscure, you know, book somewhere that I just haven't heard of or caught on to yet. That, yeah, I don't think there is a really for T and formalized set of questionnaire questionnaire that's out there. So Yeah, which is crazy because like nineteen forty seven, Kenneth Arnold, UFOs over Mount Rainier, and you know, here we are, twenty twenty one, still like clueless. Yeah, very much so, man. Very much so. Do you think that uh Kenneth Arnold would have thought that we'd still be doing this uh how many every years later? <laughs> Probably not, man. Um I'm sure our, our forefathers in this field thought we'd have her act together a long, long time ago. Yeah, a lot of them were had high hopes for uh, the new millennium. They're like, oh, when it hits all those zeros, that's when the thing's going to happen. We're, we're, we're 20 years past that, and we're still, you know, <laughs> chasing our own tail, so. They're still puzzling and arguing the same fervor that they were back then. Uh, Kenneth Arnold flew over Mount Rainier in Washington, and he saw nine boomerang-shaped objects in the sky that moved through the air like saucers skipping across the water. 80 years later, still not a clue. If we all have a, a common goal in mind since then about having like a, a database, why? what's the holdup? Why is that a thing that we still have to work towards? Is it just the infighting, do you think? I think so. I mean, I, I really do. It's a combination of the infighting. Yeah, and sorry if I keep focusing on UFOs because that's the that's the one that captures my imagination the most is those little lights in the sky. But it's the same with uh, Sasquatch and UFOs. Um, a lot of people are just kind of spectators that find it entertaining and they enjoy the stories, and that's good. You need an audience. But the ones who are supposed to be like, okay, we're we're big researchers and we're documenting everything, spend a lot of time doing infighting or collecting certain stories that fit to their theory or something. They do have archives and stuff, some of them, but they're disparate and they're separate and they're not networked together. Yeah. I mean, you talk from what you know. I mean, that's, you know, as you say, you're, you're coming from a UFO perspective and, you know, I, I come from, a, I guess you'd say more of a parapsychological and, you know, spiritual perspective and it, you talk from what you, your, your knowledge base is. Is, man so i mean it's it's all good there but dude, the the infighting and all that kind of territorialism that's that's across the board that's with just about every subject within this i mean even subjects you know outside of the, the paranormal or supernatural i mean there's this kind of infighting in just about every book you look at i'm not so sure that i really would be considered from the ufo field because um what I started with was just in the Mothman and stuff. I guess that's UFO related, but it's mostly just that one story that kind of got me into things and West Virginia folklore. So that was my my origin is definitely that is finding John Keel and Jeff Walmsley and Monsters of West Virginia by Rosemary Ellen Golly and Lauren Coleman's Mothman Other Curious Encounters, finding those kinds of books in the library. So but what was your the first spark of your interest the you know that made you start investigating? I guess it would have to be kind of the way I grew up. I always did kind of gravitate towards books on like weird stuff. And I liked being that kid that knew all the kind of odd stuff that no one else knew about. I mean, that was just, I don't know, that was my niche, I guess, when I was uh, in, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, so on and so forth. But I mean, what really kind of pulled me into things was, I say, I guess, flipping back to the spiritual side of things, growing up kind of an, an old fashioned Appalachian upbringing is that funerals were a way of life around where i lived um that was the one event so to speak that uh everyone you know, came down from the hills and got together i mean you know it was either a birth or a death that brought everyone together 
you know, because you wouldn't see someone for five, six, seven, eight years. But, you know, someone passed away, boom, they were there. And, you know, so my grandmother would take me to those almost on a, I'd go, you know, two funerals a month. I mean, growing up, it was just, she knew everyone and everywhere. And that's, you know, where we gathered to to social network. You know, that's, (laughs) that's where we uh, did the meet and greets with people. So being kind of close to death and that kind of thing, um, you know, that always sparked the interest of, well, what happens afterwards? You know, where where does, you know, is that person still around? Is that person, you know, gone and moved on to somewhere else? Did they cease to exist altogether? Just beginning to question that. And then also, you know, various childhood experiences with hearing floorboards creak throughout the house, uh, hearing my name called at random when I was growing up, you know, like I would be sitting there playing with uh, my He-Man or G.I. Joe's and, you know, all of a sudden I'd hear, David, come here. I'd get up, I'd run, you know, to the kitchen. I was like, what do you want, Mom? I was like, I didn't say anything. Yet we'd be the only two in the house. Or, you know, um, when we would go to, like, uh, the wake after a funeral, you, you know, you always gathered at the house of the person that passed away. And, I mean, you always just kind of felt a presence in the house. It was just one of those things that, I don't know, those, those kind of events in my life or those kind of feelings is what kind of pulled me in this direction. And I collected books on it. I, I read it whenever I went to the library because, you know, after school, I would, my grandmother taught a literacy program for adults. So I would go spend a couple of nights a week with her at the library and I have three or four hours to kill. So, I mean, I would sit and I'd grab books on the weirdest stuff possible. So, I mean, yeah, that kind of stuff is what pulled me in this direction and built a foundation of where I'm at today. And then I say about 20 years ago, I just, I decided to go full tilt. It was, you know, it was less becoming a a hobby and more of a, uh, of a a calling, I guess you would say would be the, the appropriate word. So, I mean, I dusted off all those old books I collected when I was a kid and started, you know, collecting new ones and, you know, hitting up flea markets and, you know, a little, rinky dink book shops and grabbing just whatever I could on the subject matter and brushing myself up on it. Then I, I tried to kind of start my own little research group. Didn't go as perfect as I was like, because at the time I had nothing to model it after. Uh, so yeah. Uh, then I was uh, introduced to a gentleman by the name of uh, Sean and that's what kicked off the, uh, the uh, supernatural media group that I, I worked with for years. And, um, yeah, from there, it was just, uh, yeah, it just kind of grew greater and greater into a, a, a thing for me to follow. It, it became less about there for a while, the search for truth than helping people. I mean, there was great, uh, a lot more satisfaction in helping people than there was making sure I knew all and knew more than the guy next to me. I mean, you know, that was kind of a selfish approach I took into going into it at first. But, yeah, you know, I feel like this has helped turn me into a much better person you know, this path that I'm walking on now. So, so what was the, some of the problems with your original group? If you could uh, share those so I don't fall to the same things. Everything was territorial. Like all of them wanted to be paid to go to people's houses. And, you know, that was the first objection that I had. It's like, look, dude, we're, we're doing this for a, a learning purpose. And B, if this guy's calling us for help and they live in, you know, a rinky dink shack, this guy ain't going to have a hundred bucks to pay us to come to his house. Yeah, I I didn't want to fall into that. Uh, So I kind of just stepped away from the group. And, you know, they were also doing it for thrill seeking. I mean, they were in it for the jump scares, too. So I definitely wanted no part of that. Um, So, yeah, I I stepped away from them, kind of went back to my own solitary studies. And then, like I say, I I found these other guys and they were, you know, even though I didn't agree 100 percent with their point of view on the paranormal, they were open to my ideas and I was open to their ideas. And it was just one of those things that gelled where the open-mindedness of the group is what helped us succeed for the years we were operating. So, uh, I think that points to another reason why some researchers work in solitude is bad experiences. Yeah, I mean, very much so. It's Once you've become, I guess, uh, your, your perspective on something has become tarnished, it's really hard to get the stains out of it, so to speak. So, yeah, I mean, because no one wants to repeat a bad experience like that, but... I mean, hopefully, you know, what we're building here will will hopefully be a, a nice place for people to come on board and have you know, good and positive experiences out of it. 
So what books and authors uh, do you like that helped you with your paranormal journey? Uh, let's see. Um, I think most everyone in this, this group has been kind of pulled in by John Keel at one point in time or another. Uh, the, the first book of his I picked up, of course, was Mothman Prophecies. And I've read that from cover to cover you know, three or four times at this point. Let's see. Who else has really had a, uh, uh, a good spin on things? Um, like I say, uh, you know, we had a discussion online earlier about you know, Linda Godfrey. I enjoy kind of her perspective on, you know, the, the cryptid thing. There's a lot of authors I have, like, singular books of that you know, I should probably track down more of. But um, a gentleman by the last name of Licato with, from France, I believe, has written some really good books on uh, uh, why places are haunted and, you know, why, they, um, why there are spirits in houses, you know, for good and for bad. Like, he had one that I have on my shelf called The Tradition of Household Spirits. That's the long history of people intentionally putting spirits into locations for protection. Hmm. You know, whether they would, uh, church, early churches in like the 11th, 12th century would take a young girl usually and bury them alive in the foundation of the church because an innocent soul would protect their church. Jeez. Yeah. Or, um, the, uh, I, I wrote a, an, an article a little while back about uh, how bridges seem to be a very paranormally active kind of location. And once more, kind of in history, uh, it was always believed the pers first person to cross a newly built bridge, uh, the devil was going to take their souls. What they used to do is they used Whoa. to take inmates and they would make a inmate that was condemned to death cross the bridge first because he was going to get hung anyway. So you might as well go ahead and give him to the devil now. So, <laughs> okay. You just, was, uh, um, that, that where, where's that superstition from the first person to cross a bridge? Cause that, that has meaning uh, to me. That is, um, a European belief that came from once more back in kind of that 11th, 12th century. Cause, um, I read correspondence between John Keel and Mary Heyer. She messaged John Keel and said, you know how the, the Silver Bridge collapsed after they yeah. at that collapse, they built a new one, right? Right. The Silver Memorial Bridge. She messaged John Keel and said, I'm the first person to cross the bridge. She said that, that they just built it, and she and her friend were the first person to cross it, and she died in 1970. Wow. Yeah, so that man, just... that's, the, that's a trip. I was not aware of that one. Yep. That's what you get from reading a bunch of these uh, you know, correspondence. But yeah, I'm sure that's just a coincidence, but that's really uh, spooky. And, you know, and there's works about, you know, uh, from people like Anthony Peake that discuss, I guess you'd say, out-of-body experiences and parapsychological stuff, you know, when it comes to ESP and things like that. Actually, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of Russell Targ, who is probably most well-known for uh, uh, remote viewing. You know, I, I find a lot of fascination in remote viewing and the fact that, you know, it was a method that our government employed for many, many, many years, you know. Yeah, I've got like an they, Ingo they, Swan book. I think he has something about that. Yeah. Yeah, he was a part of that program as well. Yeah. Yeah, dude, my, my library runs full on across the game. You mentioned Joshua Cutchin. I like a lot of his stuff. I've got a, actually a copy of his uh, Trojan Feast sitting here on my desk that I've started at least four times, but <laughs> eventually yep. I'm going to eventually finish. <laughs> now, I have a, a habit of buying all the books of like a, a specific author. If I like one book they've written, you know, I get into like their, their voice. And so I want to read all the things they've written and uh, also uh, go down the bibliography and buy a bunch of the references. And Joshua Cutchins has like these massive bibliographies in the back. Yeah, like I say, I, I've enjoyed uh, you know, stuff of his, uh, and you got people that pull together like collections of stuff like Brad Steiger and Hans Holzer and stuff like that. I think did a lot of good work back in the, um, well, I mean, Brad Steiger was working up and almost until the day he died. So, I mean, he started in the, was it the 50s or 60s, I believe. So, yeah, him and his wife has collected information on just about every subject you can imagine for, for decades and decades, so. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's a classic. Everyone's got at least one of his books on their shelf. I like uh, um, Alien Meetings. Oh uh, yeah, let's see. Do I have that one? I don't. I don't believe I have that one. Okay. It's a good one from from the seventies. The seventies is probably my favorite decade. It's when everything was really going at its peak. It's kind of when the whole high strangeness UFOs melding with Sasquatch became a real thing. Just off the top of my head, I mean, those are the a lot of the a variety of the people I pull from. So. So you were talking about uh, your upbringing before you got into the paranormal, and um, I found that to be true that when the the spark of inspiration, you know, when that sparks, you notice a bunch of other things in your past. Like when I first got 
interested in the paranormal. I thought that I had no interest. I thought that there was nothing that would have led to that, right? But then I look back and, you know, I realized how superstitious my upbringing was and started remembering some ghost stories and, and sort of identifying a lot of superstitions in my, in my life and my upbringing because, you know, your parents kind of tell you things and they tell you advice, but they also tell you, like, don't uh, spill salt or if you do, throw it over your left shoulder or whatever. So they kind of mix in those ideas with the advice and with just general life stuff. And so sometimes it can be kind of hard to figure out what's a superstition and what's just like, you know. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, very much so. I, I, I think that we're, we're both right along kind of the same path that, you know, one hindsight being twenty twenty, looking back, uh, you know, at my life, yeah, seeing just how it was it was colored and, and led in the direction that it led that you know, it's no surprise that i wound up where i am today um you know and we yeah we we had those superstitions like today you know even to this very day right now man i i cannot step on or even across you know someone's gravesite it just yes. that is you know major bad mojo in my opinion so yeah very very careful in cemeteries there's a lot of things about that yeah very much so you don't look behind yourself when you walk out of one yes exactly or um, you will be followed Exactly. So yeah, I, I when I first got into the paranormal, I got into Mothman and stuff like that. Uh, the thing is, I was very skeptical, or at least I, I thought I was very skeptical, and that you know I didn't believe that UFOs were aliens. I didn't believe in an afterlife, and I didn't believe that uh, Sasquatch things like that were real world animals. You know, I thought that okay, if you don't believe those things, then you have no reason to be interested, right? But John Keel sort of showed me that. There's a, a way in which all of those things can be true, but at the same time, the paranormal could still be a thing, and there's still a reason to be interested in it, a reason to be intrigued in it. And so him kind of saying that UFOs are not E.T., but they are something, and they do exist, and there's another explanation, and then they're all one thing, it's sort of this idea of the trickster, and it, it's a way in which all those people can be wrong while still, you know, the paranormal being a real phenomena. The idea that they are like a manifestation and that they somehow are related to the collective unconscious, that they interface with the mind, that it's a, a Trojan horse, as he called it, Operation Trojan Horse, that appealed to me. And that seemed to make sense in the way this thing operates, because it doesn't operate like some an intelligent civilization from a far off planet. It operates like a fever dream, like a trickster, like, and that's the whole idea of high strangeness, very dreamlike. And so I think that's what got me into the paranormal. But even before then, before I was even interested in entertaining the idea, it was just, you know, Mothman as a folklore. I'm like, I like West Virginia. I like this uh, folklore. It's just a folklore. It doesn't have any truth to it, but it's really cool. And I don't think the witnesses were lying, but I don't know what they saw. And maybe they were mistaken. That's, that's how I thought. But, you know, over time, it grew on me and John Keel's theory grew on me. And I realized there could be something to this. And that's, you know, what made me a full on researcher. But, you know, before I was just like, folklore, it's, it's cool, it's folklore. And um, I, I saw Mothman as this great mascot for West Virginia. And I think that's probably why I'm so, you know, so dedicated to researching and investigating, because I feel that it's important, even if it ends up not being true. Some people might have more doubts because they're like, oh, if this isn't real, then what's the point? But me as someone who's interested in like psychology, sociology, folklore and culture, to me, it's interesting no matter if it's real or not. But I do leave open that possibility that this is a real phenomena that we're interacting with, uh, this sort of spirituality. So that's what I think is why I'm an investigator, is that possibility, but also the drive to document it anyway. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 that darn trickster element, man, that, that thing pops up um, almost regardless what kind of belief stance that, you, you know, that anyone takes. I mean... Short of the hardcore, absolute, you know, as we kind of discussed that materialistic science point of view, you know, short of that one, the that trickster is absolutely everywhere. That trickster element is there to cast a doubt on a situation. I mean, Bigfoot could be very well a flesh and blood thing, but that trickster element's out there to make it look just off enough to create doubt so that people stay engaged and the people keep looking. I mean, it's almost there to kind of goad people on to bring them in um i mean and that's kind of shamans from uh, the amazon are very um big proponents that you know spirituality itself would not exist without the trickster because he creates the mystery that draws people into spirituality 
because, I mean, if everything was black and white and we knew all, then there would be less people, I guess you would say, actively engaged and wanting to know more. But that that trickster constantly messing with people, that, that doubt always brings more people in than knowing for a matter of fact. So. And uh, that's kind of why I look at John Keel as very much skeptic bait. Like he is someone that the skeptics can really go for because he's often very cynical and, and flippant. And, um, you know, he is skeptical himself in much the same way Charles Fort's skeptical. He's probably trying to be like Charles Fort. He's someone that skeptics can look at and say, oh, yeah, that's a good theory because it's not the same theory that everyone else has been saying for years and years and years. And so, you know, you're more open to it because you haven't heard it before, you know. And I do think it's the, the best theory, like the one that fits in the most. So it's definitely the one I go with. But as I said, even if it's just a, a way of viewing folklore it's a, a good frame of reference and i do feel that regardless these things should be collected together in a intersectional way i think about that quote uh, aristotle said that it's the mark of an intelligent mind to entertain something without accepting it and so i think that every paranormal investigator has to do that and has to be of two minds in a way there has to be the reality in which all of this is true and the reality in which all of this is false and then you have to square that away where you do the same thing which is we document these things regardless. So that's where I'm at anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, that that quote, I mean, truly fits the, the field itself perfectly. And people that are involved in it should be able to, to come at it from both those points of view. I mean, it's being able to be open and, and receptive to entertain just about any thought, regardless whether, you know, it's something that you're willing to roll with or not. It's, that you know, that's very important and being able to, you know, grow ideas later on. I mean, you might not agree with something today, but 10 years from now, you may come across a situation where you may be reading a book or something like that, where that thing that you were told that you said, oh, hell no, to back, you know, 10 years ago, it was like, oh, well, you know, now that makes sense. Not discounting anything, but, you know, retaining an open mind about it is, is very important. Yeah, and plus, um, I believe different things from moment to moment. I think everyone does to a certain degree. When someone tells me a very compelling story that might be outlandish, for the moment, I believe it. Later, I'm, lo I'm looking back on it, I'm you know going into investigator mode, and now I, I maybe don't believe it. But for the moment, you believe it. So I think that's part of uh, you know the investigator spirit is um, yeah. you know whatever drives us towards these uh, bizarre stories, be it just that they're outcasted and bizarre and strange and that we're outcasted and bizarre and strange or that we are alienated in some way. Yeah. I was going to bring up um, superstitions now. I have a, a post here that I posted a while ago going down some superstitions I've heard. Since we're both from the Appalachian region, I wanted to hear, and you were talking about your upbringing, I wanted to hear if you've heard these before. Never leave a swing swinging or a rocking chair rocking. That's one that I was told as a little kid, and, um, you know, I would go in the playground swings, and when I got up, I would <laughs> turn around and stop the swing so it wouldn't keep swinging. Um, I'd heard the rocking chair one. I had not heard the swing. I think the idea is that if you leave a rocking chair rocking, a spirit will come sit down. Yeah, it, it's kind of like leaving an invitation, so yeah. By the way, that's why my mother will not buy a welcome mat. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. You ever heard that one? I had not heard that one before, no. Yeah, another that is, that is definitely interesting. A lot of these are like, um, don't leave something a certain way. And this one is, um, the person who opens a pocket knife must also be the one to close it. Yep, I know that one. Yeah, I mean, that was, um, a good buddy of mine, uh, uh Billy. Like, he was absolutely positively, I mean, he lived by that, that code, uh, well, to this very day. I mean, yeah, that would be interesting to know where that one came from. Uh, the next one is, if you talk about your dream before you eat breakfast, it will come true. I do believe my grandmother used to say that one. Yeah. It also come, comes into the idea of like an incantation that if you say something, yeah. it makes it true. Yeah, because I believe my grandmother, yeah, she used to actually keep a, a dream journal and then she would you know, occasionally share those with uh, you know, us grandkids. But yeah, there was definitely a, a thing where like you know, if we spent the night, we'd ask about her and she's like, uh, you can wait. <laughs> you know, let's let's wait till the end of this afternoon. I'll, I'll jot it all down and we'll you know, we'll talk about it then. Uh, if you get chills, someone is walking on your grave. Yep, that one's uh, definitely one that's been around for a while. If your ears turn red, someone somewhere is talking about you. Yep, familiar with that one. If you forget something at home, do not turn around to go get it. I'm trying to, I don't think I've heard that one. Some of these, by the way, are really, like, they really make your life difficult if you actually follow them. For example, like, if you forgot something, you had to, like, walk backwards because you can't turn around. 
or like one thing I think my mother did was like take a different route so you're technically not turning the car around <laughs> like you forgot something at home you can't go back and get it it's like a thing well I wonder if uh, my other grandmother followed that because she would do that so interesting uh, if a black cat crosses your path, you have to X your mirrors. And I always wondered what the heck that means. Um, I hadn't heard that one. But, uh, I mean, one, of course, that plays into the, the, the black cat crossing your path and bad luck. And mirrors also being a, a luck thing. Yeah, I think it means, like, take your finger and, like, draw an X over the mirror. Yeah. I know the X's probably come, like, go down to, like, some kind of cross thing. Yeah. I mean, it was a... Uh... I, you give, putting an X on thing was kind of a, a traditional way of uh, blocking out a hex because I know, you know, some a lot of the, or a handful of the old timers anyway that thought that, you know, if there was some bad juju going on, you know, they would make an X real quick, you know, somewhere to, you know, to block out the, the bad juju. So Two more here. One is never watch as a hearse goes by. I've heard that one. And don't whistle in a graveyard, you'll wake the dead. And I've heard that one. Okay, so those are just some some uh, childhood superstitions there. You know, you, you kind of get trained on some of those, and you can't undo them. I feel like sometimes you just don't want to know the superstitions, you know? Like, did you yeah, know yeah, you like... can never wear a, a red shirt? Like, oh, okay. <laughs> or if you do, you have to <laughs> jump around three times and put your left foot in, put your right foot out, and do the hokey. Trying to abide by the uh, the all the superstitions that are out there, man, would make life an absolute unbearable mess, so... Yeah, the one about um, the salt over the shoulder thing seems to come down to that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah passage where the city burns, and if you look behind you, you get turned to salt. So it's like salt over the left shoulder, but also it's like supposed to be putting salt in the devil's face because the devil doesn't like salt because um, Christ said, my people are the salt of the earth because salt was valuable. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and you know, yeah, and salt ties into that whole purity thing as well. I mean, that's when they talk about... Uh... You know, salt in your doorways and your your windows or um, and actually, you know, got a good one for you where, you know, if you're uh, running into a series of bad luck, uh, putting chili powder, ground up pepper and your footsteps. And mm -hmm. that way, whatever bad luck's following, you will get the hot foot. And leave you. Yeah, I know paranormal investigators love to use salt on like haunted items or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, they, uh, they I've seen them bless it like holy water. So. Did your, um, I guess, how superstitious was your family? Did they uh, use Bible passages for things like that? Um, I would say that my uh, grandparents were very much more so than my parents. Of my parents, I'd say my father was probably more superstitious than my mother. He, he truly did kind of go a lot more along with the old ways than, say, my mother did. She was liked being, I guess, a more modern-day woman. Um, I know that we talked before, and you said that, like, I, I mentioned folk magic, and you said they wouldn't call it that. They would just call it, like, um, medicine or something like that. Yeah, they call it, like, mountain medicine um, was probably the more common term because, yeah, if you call it medicine, it's there to fix something. It's 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 there to uh, cure what whatever kind of problems ailing you were. Like, say, if you called it magic, you know, that's something that the, the hags and the witches did. And, you know, God didn't approve of magic, but medicine was okay. Yeah, like using certain passages for healing and stuff like that. That yeah. was a thing. I was going to ask if uh, your family ever did that thing where they take a wedding ring or a pencil and put it over the pregnant person's belly to see if it's a boy or a girl. Uh, no, I can't say that. They, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen any of my family members do that, that one. Okay, but do you know like what I'm talking about? It's kind of like a like a pendulum. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. I have I have seen it, but you know, just not within my family. So yeah. Okay, so I was going to say, uh, I talked about how I got into it through folklore and through Mothman. And like I said, I consider myself very, very skeptical. But I, I do feel that in the same way that you spark fire by building up the, the brush beneath it, you kind of have to have some basis there. You kind of have to have some sticks already lined up for the spark to actually ignite. So you have to have something, a little bit of something in your past that makes you actually get interested in this stuff. Because I, I got into Mothman and then I thought back about some of the ghost stories and the superstitions I'd heard and things like that. We went to the Mothman Museum, we went to the Flatwoods Museum, we went to the festival and I kind of networked with people there and stuff like that. And then we went to Moundsville, and that's where I met Steve Hummel of Paranormal Quest. I went to his museum, his Archive of the Afterlife. He invited me to do a paranormal speaking arrangement as the Mothman story, and he introduced me and everything. Justin Brown of Interface Death, who's been on before, that's where I first met him. 
And then later, more officially, at the Mothman Festival in 2018, we did a collaboration at the TNT area with uh, two other investigators who I met. One of them I met from the comments section of one of my videos, and the other one was a friend of his who we collaborated with a lot. That was uh, Spectra Wolfpack and Epic Paranormal TV. And then from there, I continued my cross-county tour, as I call it, because it's not cross-country, it's cross-county. And, you know, kind of tried to catch up on everything and throughout 2019. And then as 2019 came to a close, I decided that 2020, I was going to start collaborating. I was going to put together my research society that I've had the idea for for a long time, since like 2018. Pushed back a little bit, but it was through Discord and things like that that I realized, okay, we can do this digitally. Because I was going to announce it back in like January, but then, you know, things got a little crazy. So I'm like, nah. We'll hold off until next year or hold off until whenever. But then by around September, you know, with a canceled Mothman Festival, I started wanting to talk to people and stuff. So set up the, the Appalachian Mystery Society in the digital way. That's been my journey thus far. Um, and also just a bunch of reading and researching and document making and all that fun stuff. Uh, one thing I think was really cool was I found the gravestone from the original Clendenin November 12th sighting. Homer Smith, which is in uh, Reamer Hill Cemetery, able to find out what cemetery it was and find the exact headstone, and it says right on there, Homer Smith, 1966, and it's right there in Clendenin, so I say it has to be the location. So I was able to narrow that down, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I actually, yeah, I actually caught the uh, the video you made of that one. That one was a pretty cool find. Mm -hmm. And um, spent a lot of time on the Mothman wiki, which I then turned into the archive and the database. Really, one of the things that started me on my analytical archivist kick was definitely the fact that John Keel told the story of the Mothman prophecies out of order. Like, if you've ever read that book, it's a great book. But my one criticism is it's not chronological. It's not in order. I had to get the, all the sightings and put them in order. Uh, there are some sightings in Strange Creatures from Time and Space from 1970 that aren't in the Mothman Prophecy, so I had to put all those together. And then Jeff Walmsley, in his books, he interviewed witnesses that hadn't been interviewed by John Keel. And then Walmsley has all those great newspaper clippings. And then also that great archive, johnkeel.com, which is run by Doug Skinner. Uh, he's got a lot of great stuff there, so... And then, of course, my interest grew beyond just Mothman, just West Virginia, to broader Appalachia, and to all aspects of the weird and mysterious. Oh, very cool, man. And I'm, I'm really glad that you, you know, took the initiative and you know, moved forward with the, the AMS. I mean, that was, um, you know, when I reached out to you initially on, uh, on Twitter, I mean, yeah, I was explaining that, you know, I'd wanted to do the very same thing, but, you know, I lacked the, uh, the resources and... When I was first initially trying to, to, to think of how to do it, man, I just, I didn't have the, um, I felt I was doing it all myself. So yeah, I just kind of worked myself into a hole, got kind of discouraged and shelved the idea. But yeah, when I saw yours pop up, I was like, awesome. There's someone there with the exact same kind of mindset of trying to pull all this together and, you know, definitely got to reach out to them. So yeah, man, I, I definitely appreciate you making the effort to put all this together. Once you have that foundation built up and then, yeah, you start actually getting the, the organizational bits in place you know i truly think that the work itself will get a lot smoother a lot easier and be able to almost hopefully take a life of its own hopefully getting all the people involved and as you said in their various niches and stuff like that so yeah i don't think we can really section out and um have this many ufo researchers this many ghost researchers and this many sasquatch researchers but you know if we cultivate people who are interested in everything i think that's a good thing and we have a nice mix yeah. of people who have different things that they're into i think that's that's good you know it doesn't have to be yeah. like one to one. Oh no no it, it, it doesn't i mean putting out the the call so to speak to attract a broad spectrum of people i mean yeah you're going to get people that are specialized in this that or the other thing but i mean People having a broad interest in learning a little bit of it all is definitely what will help things thrive. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I really like from what you've said that you're someone who's interested in the actual sort of research and helping people who are struggling with the existential weight of what they have seen or what they've experienced in their lives. Because some of this stuff is, you know, the close encounter stuff is actually very frightening to where it's uh, essentially equates to a traumatic experience, right? And that's kind of what right. you've gone into. So people like that, yeah, definitely we need to improve the work there because, like I said, we have amateur interviewers. I'm hoping yeah, that I we mean, can improve that so that to give more relief to people who are in that situation. And you got you got to have some kind of degree of, of empathy in there. And, you know, when you're interviewing someone about something, as you say, you know, it, a lot of these are 
traumatic experiences. I mean, they've seen something that would just shake their entire paradigm of the, the life they've been living. You know, they've been around 50 years, they saw a UFO, and for 50 years they swore up and down that that kind of stuff didn't exist. But lo and behold, there's this floating thing with multicolored lights in front of them, and, well, they don't know how to process it. So being able to help someone process that, and as they're interviewing it, they're reliving the experience... Well, you want to help them work through that experience as you're talking to them. I mean, yeah, uh, we're, we're talking, you know, we got to collect the data first. But, you know, after all the data is collected, you know, you still want to leave that, that wound open and raw. I mean, you need to kind of work with that person to, to kind of help bring them back down, help them understand that you lived this long and you were OK. You'll, you'll live through tomorrow and the next day and you'll be OK. So John Keel had his sort of uh, what he called the silent contactees, which were people who had gone through strange experiences that he kind of checked in on over and over again. So he was sort of like, um, you know, counselor in that way. Yeah, you're, you're building a rapport with these people. So, I mean, it's, it's important that, yeah, you just don't use them, chew them up and spit them back out and leave them to their own devices. I mean, they're, they're coming to you to, to spill their heart out. So, I mean, yeah, doing as he did and follow up with these people and maintaining contact and letting them know that, if there's anything else, you know, don't be afraid to come to us. We're here to help. It'd be cool if we had an army of trained psychologists who are interested in the paranormal and could help out, but we have to do the best of what we have when it comes to civilian researchers and sort of amateur journalists and stuff, and we just got to do the best we can and try to help the people the most. Sometimes this stuff gets a lot of attention in, like, October and stuff like that. Like, that's when a lot of the more professional journalists will take a look at this stuff. But, you know, there has to be someone who is looking at this stuff 24-7. And I guess that falls to us, that we look at these kinds of experiences all year round. Yeah, the mainstream and the general public, you know, they, they want their spooky stuff or their weird and strange when it comes around to that that fall time. And But you just can't leave things localized at that time period. As you say, there needs to be people that are... Because, I mean, ghosts and UFOs and Bigfoot don't just pop up in October. So... <laughs> So, yeah, you need a network of people that are, are looking into this at all times. Exactly. You know, like I say, the, if you're truly working in this field as a serious study, I mean, 90% of your time is going to be behind ink and paper. <laughs> some, some people, for some reason, think that they're going to be, like, glamorous and that they're going to be cool when really you're going to be buried under piles of books. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether you're writing something down or you're reading something. That's where 90% of the legwork is. The field is just, it pops up when it pops up, but that's not something you're legitimately investigating, you know, every other day of the week. I find uh, investigating, or researching rather, with ink and paper and books to be meditative in a way. You know, I enjoy that, and sometimes I read a book that I've already read because I like the, the sort of, I know what's going to happen, I know how it's going to go, and I find that meditative. I've probably read The Mothman Prophecies a hundred times. I'm in a, a constant cycle of rereading it. But uh, that actually falls in line with something I read about meditation, which is if you focus on the mysteries and the nature of the divine, that the divine will take notice and lead you towards enlightenment and lead you towards real illumination. And so if we spend all our time reading these books and wondering at the nature of uh, these mysteries and what's going on, looking up to the skies and wondering what those lights are, perhaps they'll take notice and lead us to the answers. I can very much agree with that statement. I mean, Poetic investigating. Very much so, man. I, I agree with that that statement 100 percent so appreciate the the time you know given the night man I, I appreciate uh yeah us being able to sit here and exchange ideas thanks for uh coming to the interview and uh or coming to the meeting rather and uh answering the questions and stuff and i'll leave you with two quotes one from gray barker and one from the great charles fort the man who started all so gray barker said this i find it very uh relatable he wrote it in they knew too much about flying saucers in 1956 if there were an organization of people interested in the saucer mystery, so there could be a pool of research facilities and information, maybe all of them working together could unravel the tenuous threads of the enigma. If, I thought, some aggressive individual could organize such a group, the entire flying saucer mystery might be cracked much more quickly than we could ever anticipate. And this is where Albert Bender came in. And then, of course, Albert Bender, who ran the International Flying Saucer Bureau, was eventually shut down by the MIB, according to him, at least. But yeah, I very much agree with his thoughts there that if people actually got together they could solve this if they actually 
you know, put their minds to it, they could solve it. But that was 1956, so maybe not. And now the final quote from Charles Fort. Sometimes I'm a collector of data, and only a collector, and I am likely to be gross and miserly, piling up notes, pleased with merely numerically adding to my stores. Other times I have joys, when unexpectedly coming upon an outrageous story that may not be altogether a lie, or upon a macabre little thing that may make some reviewer of my more or less good works mad. But always there is present a feeling of unexplained relation of events that I note, and it is that far away, haunting, and often taunting awareness or suspicion that keeps me piling on. Charles Fort, Wild Talents, 1932. So this has been the Mothman Historian, and Dave. Take care, guys. Mountaineers are always free.